then the unrest in the occupied territories and Israel. The U.S. urging both sides to stop the growing violence. Patty Culhane has this update from Washington. Secretary of State John Kerry is going to be meeting with the Prime Minister next week, and he says that in the future he's also going to meet with the Palestinian leadership. Not at all clear that the U.S. has the influence or the clout to really stop the growing conflict. The big question is, what does the U.S. do next at the U.N. Security Council? They were very angry when Prime Minister Netanyahu during his election campaign said there would be no, no two-state solution on his watch. It prompted the White House to come out and say they were reevaluating the U.S. position on the U.N. Security Council when it comes to Israel. They could be talking about a potential French resolution, which would in essence demand that they come up with a solution by a certain amount of time, or they would recognize Palestine as an official state. Now, is the president considering that? Officially, the White House says they are still reviewing the policy. We'll have a better sense when the prime minister and President Obama meet next month here in Washington. They usually have a pretty t uh, tense meeting, and we'll have a better sense after they come out and meet the press. Patrick Colhane there in Washington. We'll get, let's get the latest from Jerusalem now. Al Jazeera's Carl Penhall is uh, live for us there. And Carl, uh, the end uh, of another day, another violent day uh, in Israel and the occupied territories. Absolutely, Hazan. I mean, in the early hours of Friday morning, police say that Palestinian attackers set fire to the tomb of Joseph in the occupied West Bank city of Nablus. Now, that tomb is not only a holy site for Jews, but also for Muslims and Christians. Uh, but, you know, uh, setting fire to a shrine like that can only pour gasoline on a volatile situation. As Friday moved on around mid-morning uh, in the city of Hebron, uh, we're told by police again uh, that a Palestinian man disguised as a press photographer approached an Israeli checkpoint and stabbed an Israeli soldier. He was then shot to death. Incidents like that, of course, likely to make the job of journalists even more difficult. And then if you look at the situation on the borderline between Gaza and Israel, clashes there too that resulted in the death of uh, two Palestinians after they uh, apparently opened fire on an Israeli patrol, according to police. And then uh, in the occupied West Bank, closer to Jerusalem, uh, in the town of Bethlehem, well, clashes raging all day there, protesters uh, throwing rocks, Molotov cocktails and firing slingshots at Israeli security forces, they responding with tear gas and in some incidents with live fire as well, Hazan. And Carl, on the diplomatic front, uh, as we reported earlier, that this uh, phone conversation between U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, of course, any effort to, uh, to try and ease the, the tensions has got to be welcomed. But with, with the relations between the two countries uh, so strained right now, I mean, what, what are the chances of, of any breakthrough there? What, what have people have been saying in Israel? Well, that is a complicated question, isn't it? First of all, you have to ask really right now, what weight does the United States have to influence Israel's decision, especially when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is not only responding to international pressure possibly, but he also has to respond to domestic political pressure. And his cabinet right now is a pretty hard line right wing. So he's facing pressures at home really not to see too much ground uh, to the Palestinians of course, uh, in a part of the world where distrust is already pretty much a genetic feature. And then if you look at the Palestinian Authority, well, talking to a lot of the protesters on the streets of Bethlehem today, they say that they no longer really trust the Palestinian Authority to represent their interests. They think the Palestinian Authority has had years of on-off uh, negotiations with Israel to try and get a Palestinian homeland has failed to do so. And so protesters now say that they are taking matters into their own hands. And then if, of course, you look at the wave of stabbings that have been carried out, those have been described even by the Israelis as lone wolf attacks. And so by their very definition, those would be very difficult for the Palestinian Authority to try and rein in and stop. So a very complicated scenario, both in terms of the violence and also for the diplomatic effort, Hazan. Carl Penhall, live for us in Jerusalem. Thank you.
Well, Phyllis Bennis is the director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute of Policy Studies. She joins us now from uh, Washington to talk more about this. Thank you for being with us. So, um, Palestinian youth seem to be the, the ones on the front lines of these uh, protests. Why do you think that is, and, and, and why now? Well, I think it's not surprising that this generation of young Palestinians who grew up from about the, the turn of the century, they, they were born in the periods around 2000, 2001, at the time of the Second Intifada, they have known no Israelis as anything but, settle, but soldiers and settlers. They know no Israelis. They're not allowed to meet Israelis. So this is not about any personal relationships. This is about occupation. This is about apartheid policies of separation. This is the result of the expansion of settlements, the siege of Gaza, the violations of international law that have gone on with absolute impunity for Israelis. There has been no accountability, and they're looking at this process and saying, they talk about wanting to go back to negotiations. We've had negotiations. They haven't worked. The idea of a two-state solution is widely assumed to be dead in the water at this point because of the, the seizure of land for settlements, for these colonial projects throughout the occupied territories. So in a certain way, it's kind of surprising that it's taken this long. But when you look at the, how young these people are that are lashing out in a, such a violent way, and it's a terrible thing to see, but you, you, we're talking about 13, 14, 15-year-old kids that are desperate enough to lash out on their own in these ways. These are children who have seen their fathers, their mothers, sisters, brothers, arrested by Israeli occupation authorities. They have been arrested. Children over the age of 12 are held on trial in Israeli military courts, something in clear violation of, Isra of, of international law. They have experienced that kind of oppression for all these years. They've known nothing else. Those who have uh, been slightly older, who are now maybe 18 or 19 years old, maybe got a scholarship to study in Europe, study in the United States, but aren't allowed to leave because the Israelis won't provide them with a visa to go to meet with, Israel, with U.S. officials, for instance, to find out about how to get a visa for somewhere else. So they've been locked in. The siege of Gaza continues. The situation has been absolutely horrific for ordinary Palestinians, and that's who is now lashing out. And in terms of the, the, the diplomatic efforts, I know I, I, I asked this question to our correspondent uh, earlier, but uh, yeah. Kerry planning to meet with uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu next week. Is, is there any possibility uh, of, uh, of a breakthrough there, given the, the very strained relations between the two countries right now? Well, I think there's no question that the U.S. has the capacity to put significant pressure on Israel. The U.S. has just been in the process of, of arranging for a new grant of $47 billion over the next 10 years, $47 billion of U.S. tax money to go directly to the Israeli military. That's certainly something that should give them uh, pause in Israel that there is a possibility that that could be revoked. The question is political will in Washington. It's not does the U.S. have the power. Absolutely it does. It has economic power. It could change its policy as President Obama indicated he would consider doing in the United Nations. There are calls coming out now for a, uh, a, a um, protection force for the Palestinians, something that has been discussed in U.N. circles for more than 20 years. It's never been taken seriously as an option because of what was seen to be the inevitable U.S. veto. If the veto is now a question, if there is a possibility of the United States changing its position to say we are no longer going to be the enablers of these violations of international law, we are no longer going to finance and protect an illegal occupation, illegal denial of the right of return, that yes, they would have that power. The question comes back to Washington. Will there be the political will to impose that kind of influence, to use that kind of influence. So far, we've not seen it, but that's what's going to be needed. Good to get your uh, perspective on this, uh, as always. Phyllis, Bellis, Phyllis Bennis uh, joining us from uh, Washington. Thank Thanks you. very much for your time.